And if I were a watch, I'd start popping my spree. Or if I were a bell, I'd go ding dong, ding dong, ding. In this last video of this lecture, I want to tie together a few things that we've been talking about so far. And the first thing I want to talk about is the field generated by an element. So the setup is, suppose F is a subfield of K and alpha is an element in K. Then you can take the collection of all subfields of K that contain both F and also this one element alpha. What do we know about this collection? Well, it's not empty. I mean, for one thing, K is a subfield of K that contains F and also contains alpha. And we know that the intersection of an arbitrary collection of subfields is again a subfield. It's not just that the intersection of two subfields is a subfield, but if you have infinitely many, this is still true. So what that means is there's a unique minimal subfield of K containing both F and alpha. What is that? Well, you take all of the subfields of K that contain both F and alpha, and you take their intersection. Okay. so. This is going to be an important object, the unique minimal subfield of K containing both F and alpha. And what if instead of having one element alpha and K, you have two elements, alpha one and alpha two and K, you can do the same thing. You can take the intersection of all subfields of K that contain F and also these two elements, alpha one and alpha two, or you could take an arbitrary collection of, alpha, of elements. It could be finitely many alpha one through alpha N or alpha one, alpha two, infinitely many elements. So you can take the unique minimal subfield of K containing F and alpha 1, alpha 2, and so on. You just take the intersection of all subfields of K containing F and containing your collection of elements. OK, so I just want to point out that this is going to be important for us going forward. This is a kind of idea that we've seen quite a bit before. So we've talked about the subgroup generated by a subset, or the ideal generated by a subset, the submodule generated by a subset. This fits into that framework for sure. And this is a little bit out of order because we used exactly this uh, description in the previous lecture when we talked about the splitting field of a polynomial. So we wanted to go from one extension L of our field F in which we had this polynomial P of X and F bracket X. And we found this one extension L where P factored into linear factors in L bracket X. So it's split completely in L bracket X. Uh, and we wanted to go from this one field where we knew P of X split completely to a splitting field for P of X. That means we wanted to make sure that no proper subfield of this field also had this property that P of X factored completely into a constant times a bunch of linear factors. So what did we do? We let K be the intersection of all the subfields of L that contained both F and all of the roots of P of X. So in L, we contained all of these roots. So we fixed that finitely many elements and kept F and we applied this construction. We just took the intersection of all of the subfields of L containing F and our finitely many roots of P of X. Okay, so this is important. This is gonna get uh, some official terminology. So. If we let K be an extension of F and alpha one, alpha two, up through whatever, some arbitrary collection of elements in K, the smallest subfield of K containing both F and this collection of elements is denoted by F parentheses, alpha one, alpha two, and so on, or F adjoin alpha one, alpha two. This is the field generated by these elements, alpha one, alpha two, and so on, over F. So you're starting with this one field F, and you're taking the field generated by a whole bunch of elements that are contained in this field K that's some extension of F. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this generated by language matches up with this generated by language, subgroup generated by a subset, ideal generated by a subset, submodule generated by a subset. Okay, so in the case that you take just one element, in K, this one special, this when your arbitrary collection of elements is just one element alpha, we get some more terminology. So if K is generated by a single element alpha over F, that means K is equal to F adjoin alpha 
then we say that k is a simple extension of f. And this alpha gets a special name. Alpha is called a primitive element of this extension. So this is going to be really, really simple, really important going forward, this idea of a simple extension and a primitive element, uh, because many, many, many of the extensions, field extensions that we consider will be described in this way. OK, so I'm going to pause and erase, and I'll tell you a little bit more about primitive elements. I'll give you the statement of a theorem that's coming up later on in the quarter. And then I'll talk about how this idea of taking uh, the field generated by an element over F is related to this main construction that we've looked at so far, where we get extensions of the field F by looking at F bracket X modulo the ideal generated by an irreducible polynomial P of X. We now know that an extension is called simple if it's generated over the base field by a single element. And in that case, that element is called a primitive element. So I want to state the primitive element theorem that we'll come to in uh, the last few weeks of the course. It's theorem 25 in section 14.4. So it's in the unit on Galois theory. It says that if k over f is, a, is finite, if this extension is finite and separable, then this extension is simple. So a consequence of that is that in particular, any finite extension of a field of characteristic zero is simple. So if f has characteristic zero, any finite extension is simple. So you know, what does the second part say? It's saying that any finite extension of a field of characteristic zero automatically has this property of being separable. What does separable mean? Well, that I'm not going to tell you right now, but we're going to come to that sooner than we come to the primitive element theorem. Section 13.5 is all about separable and inseparable extensions. So this is one advertisement for what is interesting about this section on separable and inseparable extensions is that this property of being separable is going to be important in understanding whether or not an extension is simple or not, whether it can be described by being generated over the base field by a single element primitive elements. OK, so what I want to do now is prove theorem 6 in section 13.1, which uh, relates this idea of taking the field generated over f by a single element and getting a field by taking a quotient of f bracket x by the ideal generated by an irreducible polynomial, this thing that's been our main focus so far in our discussion of fields. So the setup is let f be a field and p of x be an irreducible polynomial in f bracket x. And what we're going to do now is suppose that k is an extension of f containing a root alpha of our irreducible polynomial p of x. So p of alpha equals 0. OK, so we'll take f a join alpha. This will be the subfield of k generated over f by alpha. So it's the smallest subfield the unique minimal subfield of k that contains both f and this root alpha that we know is in k. Then this field, f adjoint alpha, is isomorphic to this field, f bracket x mod the ideal generated by p of x that we've been talking about so far in our discussion of fields. So let me point out, in order for this theorem to say anything, to have any content, you need to have this field k that is an extension of f containing root alpha of p of x. And how do we know that there is any extension of f that contains a root of this polynomial p of x? The whole main thing that we've done so far is show that f bracket x mod the ideal generated by p of x is an extension of f in which p of x has a root. So it contains a root of the polynomial p of x. So this extension has this subfield isomorphic to f so it's an extension of f and p of alpha i mean p of x has a root in this extension so theorem 6 relies on the fact that we like have uh, one extension in which we have this root of p of x so they're related in uh, a natural way all right, so I'm going to start the proof here, and then I'll pause and erase and, and finish it. But the main idea 
is to start with this homomorphism from f bracket x to f adjoint alpha, which we're thinking of as a subfield of k, by saying, where do I send a polynomial a of x? I'm going to send it to a of alpha. So a polynomial a of x, everywhere I see an x, I'm just going to put in the corresponding, everywhere I see a power of x, I'll put in the corresponding power of alpha. It's easy to check that this actually is a homomorphism. Uh, you know, where does this send polynomials of degree zero? It just sends them to elements of F. So this is the identity on F. It sends one to one. Uh, and where does it send X? It sends X to alpha. And we're extending in the, the natural way from here. So you can check the details of that. Uh, OK, so since P of alpha equals 0, the polynomial P of x gets sent to 0. So P of x is in the kernel of P. So our first big idea is to think, like, what do we know about the kernel of phi? Well, if P of x is in the kernel of phi, then the whole, uh, the whole ideal generated by P of x is in the kernel of phi, because phi is a homomorphism. So what does that mean? That means that if you take two things that are in the same coset of the ideal generated by P of x in F bracket x, they get sent to the same place. So that gives an induced homomorphism from the quotient F bracket x mod the ideal generated by P of x to F of alpha. That what determines where a polynomial A of x gets sent, it's not really what that polynomial is, but it's what coset of the ideal generated by p of x in f bracket x is this polynomial in. OK, so now the idea is to show that this phi prime is an isomorphism. It's clear that it's a homomorphism. So all we have to do is show that it's injective and surjective. So I'll pause and erase, and then we'll finish the proof. Let's finish the proof of this theorem by showing that this phi prime is an isomorphism. So what's true about this left-hand side here, f bracket x mod the ideal generated by p of x, this is a field. And this is a homomorphism. The kernel of that homomorphism, this ring homomorphism, is an ideal of this field. So it's either the zero ideal or it's the whole thing. And the only way for the kernel to be the whole thing is if phi prime is identically zero. OK, so that's what I have up here. f bracket x mod this ideal is a field, and the kernel is an ideal of it. How do we know that it's not identically zero? Well, think about what does phi do? Phi sends one to one. In this induced homomorphism, you still send the identity of the left side to the identity of the right side, and uh, it sends phi sends x to alpha, the, where does the coset of the ideal generated by p of x uh, containing x get sent here? It still gets sent to alpha. So uh, OK, when, when p of x is x, it's a little bit different. But don't choose p of x equals x, because in that case, there's like nothing to prove in this theorem at all. Uh, OK, so what are we seeing? Phi, phi prime of 1 is 1, really is not 0. And phi prime of x really is alpha. It's not 0. So this map definitely isn't 0, which means the only possibility for the kernel is the 0 ideal. So this map is injective. So all we have to do now is show that it's surjective. So let's apply the first isomorphism theorem here. We know that this field mod the kernel is isomorphic to the image, but the kernel is 0. So this field is isomorphic to the image. So f bracket x mod the ideal generated by p of x is isomorphic to its image, which is a subfield of f of alpha that contains f and it contains alpha. Because phi prime is the identity on f, and it sends x to alpha. So the image contains f and alpha. So by the definition of f of alpha, f, sorry, uh, f adjoin alpha as the uh, the field generated by alpha over f, it's the intersection of all of the subfields of k that contain f and alpha. So 
if the image is some subfield of K that contains F and alpha, it can't be a proper subfield of F of alpha. It has to actually be F adjoin alpha. I shouldn't say F of alpha. I mean to say F adjoin alpha. So by this definition of what this field is, the image has to be the whole thing. So phi prime is surjective, which means that B prime is an isomorphism. And that is the thing that we were trying to prove. OK, so I'll pause and erase. And I'll give one quick consequence. And then I'll very quickly talk about some examples related to examples from the previous video. Now that we know that in the setup of theorem 6, if p of x is an irreducible polynomial in f bracket x, let's suppose that it has degree n. So we know that f adjoin alpha, that the subfield of k generated by alpha over f is isomorphic to uh, this f bracket x mod the ideal generated by p of x, we saw that we have a nice description of the elements of that field as uh, the set of all polynomials in this one root theta of degree at most n minus 1. With this isomorphism, we get a nice description of the elements of f adjoint alpha. It's the set of all polynomials in alpha of degree at most n minus 1, where the coefficients come from this field k. And we think of this as a subfield of k. So, you know, alpha's in k, all these powers of alpha are in k, and that every element in f adjoint alpha can be written in this way. Just think about what that isomorphism tells you. So I want to end this lecture with some examples from earlier. x squared minus 2 is an irreducible polynomial in Q. It has no roots in Q, but it has two roots in the real numbers, All, uh, square root of 2 and the negative of the square root of 2. So let's use this square root of 2 symbol to note the positive one. Then we can talk about Q adjoin square root of 2, which is the smallest subfield of the real numbers that contains Q and the square root of 2. And we see here that we can represent the elements as polynomials in square root of 2 of degree at most 1 with coefficients in Q. So it's everything of the form a plus b times the square root of 2, where a and b are from Q. And theorem 6 tells us that this is isomorphic to this field that we constructed before, q bracket x mod the ideal generated by x squared minus 2. And now let's look at the other root of this polynomial, q adjoin negative square root of 2. Uh, it's the smallest subfield of R containing q and negative square root of 2. So it's everything of the form a plus b times negative square root of 2, where a and b are elements of the rational numbers. This is also isomorphic to q bracket x mod the ideal generated by x squared minus 2. doesn't matter which of the two roots you pick. The field that you get is isomorphic. So OK, they're both isomorphic to the same field, so they're isomorphic to each other. But that's not such an interesting result because these sets are clearly equal to each other. I mean, if you have a plus b square root of 2, that's the same thing as a plus negative b times negative square root of 2. So we're not really learning anything new here, right? These two subfields of R are obviously equal to each other. So it's not surprising that they're both isomorphic to the same field. So let's consider a more interesting example. x cubed minus 2 has no roots in Q. But it has three roots in C. It has cube root of 2, which is a positive real number. And then it has cube root of 2 times e to the 2 pi i over 3 minus 1 plus i times square root of 3, this positive square root of 3 over 2. And then cube root of 2 times the square of that, which is minus 1 minus i times the square root of 3 over 2. These are three complex numbers that you cube and get. 2. So we can look at q adjoin cube root of 2, which is the smallest subfield of C that contains q and this positive real number cube root of 2. This is a subfield of R, right? It's everything 
you can you can write it in this way. It, it's all the polynomials in this cube root of two of degree at most two with coefficients in the rational numbers. And this theorem six tells us that this is isomorphic to the field q bracket x mod the ideal generated by x cubed minus two. Okay, we could take one of the other roots and ask for the smallest subfield of C that contains Q and cube root of two times this primitive third root of unity minus one plus I times the square root of three over two. This is also isomorphic to Q bracket X mod the ideal generated by X cubed minus two. So these two fields are isomorphic to each other. The situation is different than it was up here because these two fields are not equal to each other. This one is contained in R. This is a subfield of R. And this one is not a subfield of R. I mean, this element is not a real number. So here we're really seeing something interesting that this idea of taking the subfield of C generated by one of these roots over the field Q, you get three different fields depending on which root you take. Each of those three fields. They're all isomorphic to each other because they're all isomorphic to this field that we constructed as an extension of Q in which X cubed minus two has a root. So here I think is a good example illustrating the difference between this sort of more abstract field extension and then thinking of particular subfields of the complex numbers containing Q and a choice of one of our three roots.